The Power of the Rosary is one of our most popular series. It's certainly a topic very dear to my heart. I've been preaching on the rosary since I began. In this series, I give a talk on the, the meaning of the rosary, what it is. Uh, to pray the rosary is to pray the gospel. Uh, the meditation on the mysteries, those are gospel events. Uh, the prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, they come right out of the gospel. And so to pray the rosary is to pray the gospel. And the gospel, in essence, is Jesus Christ himself. So we pray the rosary, we pray the gospel, we're praying Jesus. We interiorize Jesus, we become who we are, the body of Christ, empowered to carry out his mission. And in this series, I pray with the people. We pray the, the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious mysteries. We do the meditations, and then we pray together. I'm sure that you'll love this series, The Power of the Rosary. The gospel is Jesus himself at the end forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Turning to Mary, the mother of the Lord, and our mother asking for her intercession, together let's pray, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're gathered today with a few of our friends to talk about the rosary. Uh, we're in Houston, Texas, and this is one of my favorite topics. And so we want to do, uh, put this little series together for you. And I'm going to try in the short time we have to express to you how strongly I feel uh, about the rosary. Uh, at one time, I, the first time, I was on EWTN on Mother Angelica Live, Jeff Cavins was interviewing me. Mother was about to get on an airplane to fly to Spain. And at the end of the show, Jeff said, Father, we have about five minutes left. You could say just one thing to the many tens of thousands of people that will see this show. What would you say? That's one of those moments that Jesus spoke about, I think, when he said, don't worry about what you're to say. Your Father will give you the words. And um, I could have said a lot of good things. You know, I, I could have said, um, read the Bible every day. And that would be a great thing to do, the Word of God, so, so rich. I could have said, make a holy hour every day. Spend time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. That is a tremendous thing to do, and I think it, it's really the answer to a lot of the world's problems, all of the world's problems, really. That's not what came out of my mouth, though. That's not what the Holy Spirit gave me at that point in time. I quite simply said, pray the rosary. Pray the rosary. If you could say one thing to your best friends and your relatives and those that you love and those that you care about, what would you say? I would say just so you know what I would say. I would say pray the rosary. Now I'm going to take the next several minutes uh, to try to tell you why. In very simple terms, I'll maybe start off with um, the way I've done it with some of my good Christian friends who uh, don't believe everything that we Catholics believe, but um, they're wonderful people. Nonetheless, good Christians, they, they, they're very faithful. Um, to their religion. I might be with a pastor friend of mine in the South, a Southern Baptist, and I might say to him on a nice morning, how are you doing this morning, pastor? And he'll say, oh, fine. I said, just say your rosary yet today. And he will look at me with a very strange look, thinking I've lost my mind. You know we don't do that. We don't pray the rosary. I said, well, why not? What do you have against the gospel? Now, you don't want to say that to a good 
Baptists because they love the gospel, and rightly so. They love the word of God. Why is the rosary so powerful? It's the prayer of the gospel. I'm going to get right to the point real fast. It's the prayer of the Holy Gospel. And one might say, well, I don't see that. How, how can that be? And then you begin to explain it. The, the rosary is the prayer of predilection of the Blessed Mother. Now, it is true that there are also people who struggle with the Blessed Mother. Now, I don't have time this afternoon to give a long teaching in Mariology, although I could, I'll just sum it up for you. I'll just sum it up, synthesize it, and distill it for you. Ready? If she's good enough for Jesus, she's good enough for you. And it's that simple. The mother of God. Is Jesus God? Yeah. Absolutely. Jesus is Lord. He's a divine person. No question about that. Is she his mother? Yes. Well, how can we say she's the mother of God? By the way, that's a theological assertion in the Catholic Church. That's part of the doctrine of the faith. Is she the mother of God? Yes, without any question. We even celebrate that solemnity on January 1st. She's the mother of God. Jesus is a divine person. Mary said yes to God through her fiat, what happened? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that Word, that subject of action is divine. He assumed that human nature through the fiat, the yes, of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so she is his mother, mother of the Lord, mother of God, and our mother. Jesus gave her to us from the cross. You remember when it happened, when Jesus was on the cross? And he turned to the beloved disciple, right, John, and he said, Behold your mother. And then turning to his mother, he said, Woman. That, note that word. He, uh, Jesus uses that mysterious words, a, the word a couple of times, woman. Woman, behold your son. There's a very universal thing taking place at this point. Behold your son, behold your mother. Jesus called her woman, denoting a universality. You remember who the first woman was, Eve, right, in the book of Genesis? She is called Eve, the mother of all the living. That's what her name means, mother of all the living. That's Eve. But Eve, through her prideful disobedience became the mother of all the dead and dying. Original sin. And so theologians tell us, some of the fathers of the church, that in the fullness of time, and this is scripture, Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. Galatians 4.4. 4. That's Mary. That's Mary, the woman who brought forth that son, who is the son of God and also her son, the son of justice. Mary is very important. She is not just a casual bystander in the history of salvation. She is the one who said yes to God, and then God became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, this prayer of the rosary, we, we often think of it related to the Blessed Mother, uh, and it is, but I want to try to get you to think of it in a very biblical way, because it is. I'm going to show you that the rosary is the prayer of the Holy Gospels. Now, the rosary is an interesting uh, prayer. It's the most highly indulgenced personal prayer in the history of the church. Several popes uh, have imparted indulgences uh, to the rosary. And by the way, an indulgence is not a bad thing. An indulgence is a good thing. Uh, from the storehouse of the treasury of the church, the church has the ability, the authority under the power of the keys to give grace out of this storehouse. Uh, that sto where does the storehouse of grace come from? Well, the, from the absolutely infinite merits 
of Jesus Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection, number one, uh, from the merits of the Blessed Mother, uh, who is in Christ. She's his mother. She's not apart from him. She's in there. How about us? How about the saints? Uh, is it possible for us to merit? Yes, but never apart from Christ, only in Christ. How, do you, how are you in Christ? You get baptized. Once you're baptized, you're taken up into Christ. And so it is at that point that we can merit grace, but only in Jesus, never apart from him. Okay. So out of that storehouse of grace, the church uh, can bestow indulgences. They're gifts. The rosary is the most highly indulgent personal and private prayer, aside from liturgical prayer. It has a body and a soul. I'll bet you didn't know that. Most of you didn't know that the rosary has a body and a soul. You know, we have a body and a soul, right? We know that, that a, a human being has a body and a soul. Do you know what the soul is uh, in philosophical terms? Maybe some of you have studied a little philosophy. Uh, the soul is, as we say, the form of the body. The soul is that which gives life to the body, the animating force of the body. The soul of the rosary is the meditation on the 15 mysteries. Okay? That's the soul. What gives life to the rosary, the soul of the rosary, the meditation on the 15 mysteries. And then someone who's not familiar with it might say, but, well, well what's that? Mysteries. What, what are these 15 mysteries? And then we can go through and show them. Uh, I could say, well, the first mystery, the first joyful mystery, which we will pray together a little while later, is the Annunciation. And someone, Annunciation, well, what's that? Where's that come from? And then you and I could show them in the Gospel of Luke, first chapter, right? When the angel Gabriel came to a virgin of Nazareth, betrothed to a man named Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. And then you remember the Annunciation, right? When the angel Gabriel announced the Incarnation, announced that she would bear a son, and she, she was, how can this be? Uh, I'm not married. I have no relations with a husband. How can this be? The power of the Most High will come upon you, and so forth. That's the Annunciation. First chapter, Gospel of Luke. So if someone says, well, what are these mysteries? Where do you dream those up? We didn't dream them up. They're events right out of Scripture. First one, Annunciation. Second one, Visitation. Well, where does the visitation come from? Well, you look right in the Gospel of Luke, and you see that the Blessed Mother arose and went in haste to the hill country of Judah, and so forth, see her cousin Elizabeth, who was already six months with child. John the Baptist was her son, and so forth. The Nativity, Christmas, right? presentation in the temple, finding in the temple. Where do those things come from? Right out of the gospel. And so do we do. And the meditations on the mysteries, what we're basically doing is we're considering these gospel events all the way through. If you consider the 15 uh, mysteries of the Holy Rosary, what do you have? You have a synthesis of the gospel from beginning to end, from all the way from the Annunciation to the Passion, Death, and Resurrection and Ascension of Christ, and then the last two can be deduced from Scripture, right? The Assumption of Our Lady into Heaven, Body, and Soul, and the Coronation of Our Blessed Mother's Queen of Heaven and Earth. That constitutes a distillation a synthesis, condensation of the gospel. Now, somebody who's even more basic in their understanding, maybe they're not Christian at all, maybe they don't know anything about this. I, I actually, I have had Buddhists, I have had Hindus, uh, I have had Muslims, you know, Islamic people, that have entered the Catholic Church as a result of very, very simply stating these truths. Something happened. I don't talk them into anything, by the way. Very often people will say, oh, Father, you're an apologist. You, you defend the faith. No, I don't. I really don't. That's, people are mistaken to think that. I do not do that. I 
have never talked anybody into anything or out of anything in my whole life. I just don't know how to do it. I'm not that clever. Now, God can do it. Uh, he can use me to present a fact here or a fact there, but grace moves uh, through the truth. So, we have the rosary like us, body and a soul. The soul of the rosary, that which gives life to it, the animating force, the meditation on the mysteries, the substance of which is the gospel. Right? Now, if you are one of those people who really don't understand Christianity, you'll say, gospel? Well, what is the gospel? Now, words are very important. We have a tremendous attack on the church and on society today, and one of the weapons the enemy uses, words. Words. Uh, the misapplication of words, the misunderstanding of words, the misconstrual of words. Words are very important. How important are words? Words are so important that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's very important. What does it mean to be a word? When we say Jesus is the word of God, he is the eternal word. Uh, this is a very theological uh, statement. Uh, Jesus is the Father's only word. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, Jesus, his only Son. So you see, the word of God is the self-expression in the power of the Spirit of our Heavenly Father. Words are very, very, very important. In considering the power of the rosary, you look at the mysteries and you see it's the gospel. And you ask, what is the gospel? And I tell you, the word means good news. Okay? We know that. The word gospel means good news. And then the next logical question would be, well, what's that? You say, oh, the good news. What is the good news? Okay? Is the good news something? No. no. You have to learn how to think these things. Very simple. Very simple. The good news is not merely something. The good news is somebody. Jesus is the good news. The summation of the gospel is Jesus Christ. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself. Not a mere something. A divine somebody. Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the good news. So what are we praying when we pray the rosary? We're praying the gospel, the good news. We're praying Jesus. We begin to interiorize them, and we become who we are, the body of Christ. Now, this is a very, very simple thing, not rocket science. It's very simple, but it's very profound. And sad to say, a great many pseudo-sophisticated people will never get it. They will never get it because they are too blinded by their own pride. Uh, they think it's too simple. They would call it simplistic. It is simple, but you have to remember, if you know theology, you know God, by definition, is pure simplicity. Not to us. We can't. We, we have a finite mind. And a finite mind cannot completely encompass the infinite. And so, yes, we struggle. We struggle with it. We, we, we just can't get it all. But God, by definition, is pure simplicity. And the things of God are quite simple. Uh, little children can understand the things of God. And Jesus said, it is of such as these, meaning the children, that the kingdom of heaven is comprised. And you must become, if you would enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become like little children. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that means that you have to be simple. You have to be... Uh, let me tell you one of the most frightening things about being sophisticated and or educated. Now, education is a great thing. Um, I have education. I have some education. I have more education than most people. By the grace of God, I have five university degrees. That's a, a lot of education. But I can tell you one of the most frightening things about education is that if you're not careful, very quickly you can begin to think you know something. And you really don't. 
we can begin to think we're, as my grandmother used to say, too big for our britches. You know, we begin to think, hey, oh, look how smart I am. See how much I know. See how many degrees I have. See all those initials after my name indicating how smart I am. Listen, it's entirely possible to be educated into imbecility. Make no mistake about it. You can be educated right out of common sense, and it happens every day. And one of the worst occupational hazards of educated people, and that includes priests, theologians, teachers, doctors, lawyers, those are wonderful professions. And that education is a great and noble thing. But one of the occupational hazards is that we can be so blinded by our own light that we begin to think with the source of our own glory. I just gave a definition of Lucifer, the fallen angel, the brightest of the angels. That very word means light of the morning or morning star. One of the most intelligent of the angels. Problem was he knew it. And he was blinded by that. It's called arrogance. And he began to think he was smarter than God. Uh, do you understand that today a lot of people think they're smarter than God? Even in the church, we run into it. There are people who think they're smarter than the Holy Father, that they know more than the collected wisdom passed down to us through the ages. Uh, they reject the teaching in the catechism and so forth. Uh, this is not education. Authentic education is a journey into the truth. That's a simple definition, but a true one. Authentic education will lead you more deeply into the truth, not away from it. Very often, this occupational hazard of arrogance will result in people saying, Oh, rosary. Ah, oh, I don't do that. That bores me. That's an, an old lady's prayer. I like it when they say that. Believe me, heaven is paved with such, quote, old ladies. Uh, they have prayed for me for many years, and probably just about any good that I will ever do will be, be because of their help. And so don't discount the power of such simple, simple prayer. Well, then they, they might say, okay, you talk about the soul of the rosary, uh, the meditation on the mysteries, gospel prayer, but what about the prayers? You know, you Catholics, you say those prayers over and over and over again. Let's face it, you know, the rosary... The body of the rosary, we talk about the soul of the rosary, the meditation on the mysteries. The body or corpus of the rosary is the prayers, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, uh, primarily, right? Uh, five decades, most of us say, but there's 15 in the whole rosary. But um, we separate into, into three um, divisions of five decades each. You know, joyful mysteries, we call it. Sorrowful mysteries, glorious mysteries. And the main prayers are the Our Father and the Hail Mary. And once again, a little common sense goes a long way. And people that uh, resist this so much, I say, well, what's so bad about it? Well, we talked about the mystery. What about the prayers? What do you got against the Lord's Prayer? Nobody can argue with that, right? The Our Father, everybody accepts that, all Christians except the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. Oh, one might say, you know, let's say we're talking to a Buddhist. Well, where does that come from? Where does that Our, our Father who art in heaven, where, where did you get that? Out of the Gospel. Right? We get that right out of the Gospel. They said to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, when you pray, you are to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so forth. So you see, the, the Our Father is Gospel prayer. Once again, gospel, good news, good news, Jesus. Yeah, but what about that Hail Mary? The doubters may say, I'm glad you asked. What about the Hail Mary? Well, where'd you get that? Right out of the gospel. I already mentioned it, right? First chapter, gospel of Luke. The angel Gabriel comes. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Right? Gospel, prayer. And then, Blessed Mother goes to her cousin Elizabeth. Blessed are you among women, Elizabeth says. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Where'd that come from? Right out of the gospel, word for word. Gospel prayer. 
Okay? And who could, who could argue with the glory be that we say at the end of the decades, right? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. That's a Trinitarian praise, worship of the Trinity. That's basic theology. Everybody, all Christians, anyway, we, we believe that there's one God, three divine persons. Certainly Catholics believe it, and most Protestants do too. That's the rosary. The prayers, the body. The meditation on the mystery, the soul. That's the whole rosary. And that is the way we should think of the rosary. It's the prayer of the Holy Gospel. And what I've given you first here is the reason it's powerful. Okay? I, I've given you here the reason that the rosary is powerful. But you may say, yeah, but I don't like it. So? I don't, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. You want results? Do it. You know, it's like the Nike commercial. You ever see it? They, they say, just do it. You know, anybody who's ever tried to exercise, right, jogging or whatever you do, it's hard at first, isn't it? Why is it hard? You have to overcome inertia. That's not so easy, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, uh, the law of inertia. You know, stationary bodies tend to stay stationary. It takes a certain effort to move them. And so that initial effort is difficult. Uh, exercise, hey, the first time you do it is the hardest. The second time, it's a tiny bit easier. After two, three weeks, you look forward to it. And if you miss, you really miss it. You're so, you you want to get back to it. You, it does something for you. It energizes you. It invigorates you. Prayer is like that. In the beginning, it may seem, oh, no. It's like an obstacle. I remember when I was a little boy, growing up in a good Catholic family, we would go to visit now and then my great-grandfather. Um, most of my family was Italian, but on my mother's side, uh, my mother's uh, father, my maternal grandfather, uh, was French-Canadian. And we would go up to visit my great-grandparents, and my great-grandfather was a carpenter. And he had carved the beautiful statues of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, and he had a, a, a niche in his wall where, where he had, uh, had them in there and he he was a very short man and but he was about he was about as wide as he was short at the shoulders he was a very powerful man but not very tall and great grandfather every evening after supper would lead the family in the prayer of the rosary all the children all the grandchildren all the anybody else who was around and when great grandfather announced that we were now praying the rosary, it was not even conceivable that someone would have a protest. And he would kneel down right in front of the uh, statues of St. Joseph and our Blessed Mother. He would kneel down with his rosary and he would begin to pray. He would lead his family in prayer. Now, there were times that we children, we didn't want to do that. It was not our favorite fun thing to do. We wanted to go out and play with our cousins or whatever, but I'll guarantee you we did it. And the parents were not so lax or permissive as to let us get away with it. It only took 15, 20 minutes. And they knew that that was 15 or 20 minutes well spent. There was a movement back then called the Family uh, Rosary Crusade. Many of you... Uh, were alive then, you remember Father Peyton. If you don't remember that, I'll guarantee you, you remember his saying, the family that prays together stays together. Right? That, that part has come down to us. Even if you forgot or never knew who Father Peyton was or the family rosary crusade, you've heard that. I'll tell you what, it was true 50 years ago, and it's true today. And it is common sense. Uh, I just saw a news bulletin a week or so ago and they say that they have done research now and the government has linked um, the time that you spend with your children or don't spend with your children to drug problems or criminal activity in other words the more time you spend with your children having dinner with them the less likely they are to get in, involved with drugs gangs 
and that kind of thing. Uh, the government came up with the study. They did research, and it, it's common sense to me. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to conclude that. Years ago, it was normal. Families ate their meals together, uh, and a great number of them prayed together. Uh, religious uh, lived together in community. They prayed together. They had their meals together. Uh, they suffered together very often. You know, uh, being a religious and being a married person, these are very similar things. These are states in life that God has given to us for the purpose of sanctifying us, um, to make us holy. In other words, most people are called to the married state. It's true that most people end up getting married. That, that is the most common state in life. So it probably is the most important. God has a lot more married people than he does priests or religious, but they're all important. But married people know that it isn't easy. Oh, sure, in the beginning everything is beautiful. You're... Uh, the honeymoon and the afterglow of the honeymoon and it's just wonderful but then after a year or two reality sets in you've got to live with the guy you know or the woman and, and then it is not you can't run on emotion then there better be more than mere feelings at that point love is a decision love is an act of the will you will not be able to do it day in and day out without the help of prayer. The family that prays together stays together. Uh, I can give an example. When I was a novice, my novice master, uh, now being a religious um, or priest or seminarian, you have to live close with other people, like in a family, right? In family, you're you're in the same house with your husband or your wife or your children, parents, so forth. Uh, in a religious community, the sisters or brothers, uh, monks, they live close. They live in community. And I remember when I was a novice, I, I used to... Uh, they're all different personalities in a family and in a religious house. And sometimes uh, somebody's personality will drive you absolutely crazy. They're just, you know, I remember my novice master saying, oh, there are some people that are, that are in, um, in religious houses, just like in families, that it seems that the only function they have in life is to make saints out of others. <laughs> and you think about that, well, that's one of the reasons it's sanctifying. It exercises us in virtue. But you have to have the grace to exercise virtue. And the grace, if you don't pray, you're not going to have it. I'll give you an, an analogy. And this holds true in families or in religious life, in seminaries, any place. Any place where interpersonal relations are there. And they're there everywhere in society. Do you know how they polish gemstones? Uh, some of the ladies their uh, wedding rings, their engagement rings with diamonds, or you might have a ring with an emerald or a ruby in it. And uh, you know how they get them to be beautiful like that, to shine them, the, the normal method? They'll take the precious gems and they'll put them in a tumbler with grit, right, an abrasive material, right? And they put it, and the tumbler goes round and round, and the grit rubs off the um, rough edges in it, and it's smooths them and cleans them and they shine after a while and they're made beautiful that's life in the monastery or the religious house or the family uh, we're in there with a lot of grit sometimes and every one of us has been grit to somebody else at one time or another and so we rub the rough edges off of each other now in order to do that in order to persevere in order to be able to do it in love, you have to pray. You really need the strength afforded by prayer. And today, oh, the temptations and the struggles today, you have to pray. And most people are not going to pray unless they have a set way in a, to pray. You can pray any way you like. You've talked from your heart to God, pray spontaneously. You know, you can pray from a prayer book. 
But this, what I'm talking about, the prayer of the rosary is easy. Children do it. You know, I'd start doing it when I was six, seven years old. Anybody can do it. But it's a powerful prayer. And you know what? It's in a form that is easy. It's easy. Once you overcome inertia, and there's great power. Now, that will begin to bring down graces. When they asked me, give one piece of advice, Father, I said, pray the rosary. It brings graces to do all the other things we ought to do. When I was about 16 and headed down the wrong path, my mother, who had prayed for me day in and day out, uh, also had preached to me, uh, as mothers have to do to their children. At the time. But after I got a certain age, I don't know, 18 maybe, probably 18, knowing my mother, uh, it was after I was out of the house. But if, as long as I was there, she continued her preaching career. Uh, she terminated her preaching career uh, when I was in my late teens because she saw that it was like talking to a wall. It did no good. But my mother did not give up on me. For 20 years, my mother prayed the rosary for me every day. Day in and day out. And my mother had to witness some terrible things. Uh, she had to see her firstborn son go from bad to worse. She could see it coming. You know how it is, moms or dads. You can see it coming. They're going down the wrong road, and you know trouble is right there. You know they're starting to maybe drink and go to parties, and who knows if there's drugs there nowadays or whatever it is. You're staying out later and later at night, and you're worried more and more and more. I'll give you a little example. A few years ago, a, um, a good mother came up to me at a conference, and she said, Father, please talk to my son. And mothers are always telling me that, because they know my story. You know? And I said, well, I don't normally do that because I, I just were right. Oh, please. She was like that lady in the, in, the, uh, in the gospel with the unjust judge. Remember, she wore him out. <laughs> he finally gave her what she needed. Uh, this lady was kind of like that. She had a very compelling, insistent personality. I said, finally, okay. Uh, does he want us to talk to me? Well, no. <laughs> but she kept it up. So finally, the next day, she brought him to the rectory. And he came in, and she left. And I said, son, how can I help you? He said, you can't help me. And I said, well, what can I do for you? You can't do a thing for me. And it went downhill from there. Finally, in exasperation, I said, look, I'll just pray for you. And he scoffed. He laughed. He said, what are you going to pray for? I said, well, I'm just going to pray God kicks your butt. <laughs> now, I'm making this point because sometimes parents become exasperated or frightened or even panicked about their children. Well, about a week later, the telephone rang, and it was mom, his mom, and she was very upset. Oh, father, a terrible thing has happened. My son has been in a terrible car accident. He's in the hospital. And I remember thinking the profound thought, yes. <laughs> terrible thing to think. But I knew what I was talking about because I knew I had prayed, and I knew God had answered the prayer. Sometimes that's the answer to a prayer. Well... My mother prayed 20 years, and my world fell apart in due time. Uh, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, honestly, but I would wish the results on everybody. Uh, the results were conversion of heart. Now, I have no merit whatsoever um, in my own life. I know that. I'm not responsible for uh, my own conversion. Uh, but I know that my mother and my grandmother, uh, they prayed the rosary, and they had an enormous amount of grace at work because of their prayer of the rosary. Oh, I went right to the edge. I could have been killed many, many times, many times. Uh, I was in situations where I could have died. And I, one time I, I was living uh, in Los Angeles, and I had a a weekend date with a rather well-known actress and we got in my Ferrari and drove across the desert Friday evening to go to Las Vegas and I at one point I was going about 150 miles an hour 
and the highway patrol came after me. I didn't know they were back there because they were way back there. But they set up a roadblock and stopped me. And we were extremely nervous because in the trunk there was something that shouldn't have been there, a briefcase full of cocaine, which could have sent me to prison for a very long time. A whole entourage of highway patrol officers. I'm very good friends with a lot of California highway patrol guys these days. But back then, I was not very smart. Well, the officer in charge said, step out of the car, please. And, uh, you know, it was one of those moments when you know you're in big trouble. And uh, he said, open the hood, please. And, of course, the only thing I'm thinking is open the trunk, right? which would have sent me to prison. Open the hood. And luckily it did register, so I, I opened the hood. And about eight or nine highway patrol officers gathered around the engine compartment of that Ferrari, Ferrari and they were peering in, asking questions. Well, is it uh, fuel injected or carburetors? How many horsepower does it have? And so forth and so on. And I'm beginning to say, no, this couldn't be. Finally, they said, now look, you got to be careful. You can't drive that fast. It's not safe. I said, yes, officer, I, I'll never do that again. And I got in there and went, no. That was not a coincidence. Uh, this is like a big net. And my mother had it around me. <laughs> right? You know, I, I, I was safe because I was protected by those prayers powerful prayer, the prayer of the Holy Rosary. And so did many, many times. Uh, I have incorporated everything, my ministry, my own life, the salvation of the souls of those I love, those who I've never even met. I bring in the prayer of the Rosary, and I have total confidence that that prayer can't fail. Why? Because it's the prayer of the Gospel. And the Gospel is the good news, and the good news is Jesus. And that's why it is powerful, very powerful. Now, I've given you some of the theology behind it, as it's the prayer of the rosary and so forth, and my personal experience to go with the theology, I'll tell you something. Powerful. Absolutely powerful. I have had, oh, I, I, I don't use the word miracle lightly. Sometimes that word is overdone. Uh, I've had some amazing things happen now because of the prayer of the rosary. Impossible situations. People who were on the edge of disaster. I remember working with someone in my family that I love very much who was um, addicted to alcohol. Now, I don't know how many of you have been through that, but... Um, uh, alcohol is one of the most dangerous, um, addictive substances th there, there is. And, and it's all the more dangerous because it's legal, right? You can get it anywhere. You can get it uh, in any grocery store. In California, you, you don't need a, a license. You know, like in New York, you've got to have a special liquor license and so forth. You can buy it in any grocery store or 7-Eleven uh, in California. You, it's right there. People can get addicted to it. It is a substance that lends itself to addiction. It can control you. I know for a fact that there, at times, can be demonic forces that attach to that. I could, I could talk a long time about this. I gave a course, series of talks in July, last July, on spiritual warfare, and I told people the principles. Behind. You know how in the church, how we bless things like holy water? You know how that is? That, that they're called sacramentals. You take, holy, you take water, say a certain blessing over it. Salt, say a certain blessing out of the Roman ritual we used to do. Wherever you sprinkle that water, then that prayer is placed. Now, by the way, in the old Roman ritual, that was an exorcism prayer. The salt, same thing. Oil, same thing. It was an exorcism prayer attached to that. And, and so you had a protection of that sacramental. Do you know, I'll give you an example. Remember the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen? One time, 
uh, like I'm just about ready to face another Lent, and I always take a deep breath when Lent is upon me because I, I'm gone. I have to go constantly, one mission after the next. I go from one to the next to the next, right until May. Between now and May, it's nothing but traveling on and off airplanes, suitcase from my home, and so forth. So I have to take a deep breath. The older I get, and the more of these I do, I already know, oh boy, Lent, here comes Lent. Uh, I'll see daylight around May. Bishop Sheen was on an airplane. He was going to preach. And it was Lent, and he, they, um, in those days, the stewardess, nowadays the flight attendant, brought the, uh, the lunch. And Bishop Sheen said, well, you know, I, I think I won't take lunch today since it's, um, it is Lent, and I should um, fast a little bit, you know, so no thank you. And there was a very attractive young lady sitting next to him. And she said, yeah, I won't take lunch either. And Bishop Sheen kind of perked up and he said, oh, uh, you're Catholic too? Fasting for Lent. And she said, oh, no. She said, I'm a witch and I'm fasting for abortions. And then she went on to explain to him the reverse side of the sacramental principle how they can do things just like we do to bring evil into the world. When I was on the wrong side of the track, so to speak, um, I came in contact with some people in the music industry, uh, and there's a lot of drugs around that in Hollywood. Uh, I came in contact with an, a man who had fled Iran when the... Um, Shah of Iran was deposed. And this man, him, he was one of the biggest drug dealer in Hollywood. And I, I knew some of those characters in those days, sad to say. Well, this man uh, was in contact with these major drug traffickers. Several of them, several of them, were satanic priests and involved with witchcraft. And what they would do is they would take a huge shipment kilos of cocaine and then they would bring in this satanic priest to offer satanic mass black mass and curse the cocaine the reverse of the sacramental principle we take holy water bless salt they would take that and they would say various incantations and say i don't want to call them prayers but you know the equivalent from the other side, and those curses would attach to that material. Now, let me tell you something. The, all the people who are doing illegal drugs are not in a state of grace. And you've got to be in a state of grace to be protected from evil like that. And if, if, if you want to have a motivation, if you, you're, if you can't motivate yourself to stay out of serious sin, uh, because of love, stay out of serious sin because of that. Because once you leave a state of grace and you're living in mortal sin, those things, then this is very real. It's not an old wives' tale or superstition. These curses and hexes and so forth, they're real. And you will begin to suffer like you can. Do you know that mental institutions are filled with people who have been afflicted because of this. Alcohol can be used as a medium for transferring such things, drugs, other things too. The rosary is a powerful weapon against evil. Padre Pio, blessed Padre Pio, very often he would exclaim, bring me my weapon, bring me my weapon. And uh, you know, he wasn't talking about an M16. And the brothers would say, your weapon? Come on, you're a Franciscan. Well, you can't have a weapon. He says, oh, yeah, bring me my weapon. Bring me my, bring me my rosary right now. He understood that one of the greatest weapons to do battle against evil is the rosary. Why? Prayer of the gospel, prayer of predilection of the Blessed Mother, who is the woman Right? Remember that word, woman? Jesus said, "Be woman, behold your son. In the first book of the Bible, we've got that woman 
who crushes the head of the serpent? That's a figure of the Blessed Mother. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation, chapter 12, we've got that woman, woman, clothed with the sun. And so, you see, you have enmity. You have a battle from beginning to end. From Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God talks about combat, talks about battle. And the woman is right in the thick of it. In other words, I could synthesize this part of the talk and I, as some people like labels or titles. They, when, I, when I travel and go, they say they want the titles of what I'm going to talk on. And I'll, usually I don't give them because I don't know because the Holy Spirit hasn't let me know yet. So they want a title. But if you like to have a title on this part of the talk, it's this. Your mama wears combat boots. <laughs> That's right. She does. Our mother, the blessed mother, is a warrior. And she does battle against the enemy. Now, this is real. You've seen the uh, statues of the Blessed Mother with the snake under her, the serpent, right? Indicating the devil, you know, the serpent. Well, this is real. Look, the rosary is so powerful. It is a great, great prayer. It's my experience. Uh, it's theological, but it is my personal experience as well. I have only been preaching for seven going on eight years. I have, by the grace of God, reached millions and millions of people already. Why? If you ask me, I don't, you know, I'm not God, I can't know for sure, but other than God's plan and God's grace, if you ask me, well, how can you get that much done that fast? That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. If you will do this, you will have a protection. I'm not saying you'll be invincible. You still fight. You're still going to have the same battles that anybody will have. But you're going to have the strength to carry on. You've got a powerful, powerful ally in the mother of God. You've got a powerful, powerful weapon in the rosary, the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the prayer of the gospel. God bless. God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As we prepare to pray together this most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we, we thank Jesus and Mary for the great gift of this prayer, such a powerful prayer, the prayer of the Holy Gospels. And we begin uh, praying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he arose again, seated at the right hand of the Father, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to pause for a few minutes here before we begin with the first joyful mystery to talk a little bit about the prayers that compose the body of the rosary, the Our Father, this uh, great gospel prayer. Everybody is uh, familiar with it. They ask Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. We pray Our Father. Uh, one could meditate a long time just on that. Uh, the w words are important. Learn to think about words. Meditation really is just thinking, considering, turning something over in your ma mind. The first word, our. Uh, that is a very beautiful word, our. That, hey, us, our Father. If he's our Father, you know what that makes us, family, brothers and sisters. We have the same Father. Now, that's a profound thing. We pray, our Father. And what's a Father? You know, today we have a lot of trouble in the world. Uh, many, many people have never known a Father. Many children have never known the joy of a Father. Uh, they've never come to understand what a great thing you know, to be a father. You know, God is the heavenly father. If you want to have a dim intimation of the greatness of paternity, well, there you have it. God is father. A father, the principle of life, uh, the one who transmits life, a, a power, a potency, a father. You think about a father, nowadays, I can imagine, and I, maybe I will do it at some point, teaching just on that one word, one of the most beautiful words, two most beautiful words, perhaps, in all of language, mother and father. Absolutely beautiful realities represented by beautiful words. Our father. A lot of people are Christian for many, many years, Catholic, many, many years, and they never develop a relationship with their Heavenly Father. I think it's easier for people who had a good relationship with their dad when they were younger. Many of us did not. I did not. When I was young, my dad was, unfortunately, he was one of those who didn't understand uh, I don't think it was his fault because he didn't get it from his father. Later in life, he understood. I remember my dad, when he came to hear me preach the first time. Uh, actually, it was before that. No, uh, it was before that. Before I was ordained, I was studying in seminary, and, and, and dad said to me, I wish I could have been a better father. Oh, he meant it. Uh, he, with the wisdom of advanced years, he had changed. When my dad was young, he was everything a, a dad shouldn't be. You know. He was a womanizer, a gambler, a drinker, a rough guy. He never abused us. He never hit anybody, uh, but he was verbally abusive. Tough. Later in life, he regretted it. He left when I was 12 years old, just took off. And my mom had to raise us. But later he said, I wish. I know he would have done anything if he could have taken back his life and started over. I wish I could have been a better father. And I'll tell you something. Now, I told you last night I buried my dad September 11th. When he said that, God our Father heard him. And God our Father gave him an entrance into his own paternal 
power. My dad began to suffer. My dad began to suffer between that time when he said, I wish I could have been a better father, and when I buried him September 11th, my father had over 35 surgeries. My father had been a tough guy when he was young. He was a good athlete. He was known uh, toughness. If anybody you, you try to describe him, they'd say, oh, Tony, he was tough. You know, he was a boxer. He was an athlete. Tough guy. He was uh, in the Seabees in the Navy in World War II. Grace builds on nature. Grace builds on nature, St. Augustine says. And so my dad's nature was to be a fighter, never give up. I wish I could have been a better father, he said, and God let him enter into redemptive suffering. And he began to breathe life into my priestly ministry. And so you see, your father, your heavenly father, and even your earthly father, who makes present your heavenly father, ideally, can breathe life into whatever you're doing. And sometimes... Recalling the words of St. Paul, it is when I am weak that I am strong. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven. You ever think about heaven? I have to think about heaven more and more. The older I get, sometimes I'm discouraged. Sometimes I don't like what I'm seeing in the world. I've got to think about heaven, uh, hope is tied up with heaven. Hope, the theological virtue by which we desire heaven and eternal life. Our Father who art in heaven. I have always felt like an exile. Wherever I have lived, I have felt like I was out of place. And there's a good reason for it. Because I am. Heaven is my home because my father is in heaven our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name his holy name all holy name that I have to reverence hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come I want the kingdom of heaven right now I want it on earth I want all people into that kingdom thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven you know if you're ever worried about how to pray or what to pray for, and we all now and then think about that. People ask me that all the time. I don't know how to pray for them. What should I ask for? Thy will be done. Thy will be done. If you can learn how to pray, thy will be done, you've got power working in your life. Uh, in good times and in bad, thy will be done. Uh, I have been given a two-edged sword of a gift. It's called sensitivity. Sensitivity is good in that you can empathize with people in their suffering. I sympathize with every sinner on the face of the earth. There is no drug addict, no alcoholic, no prostitute, Nobody so low that I can't sympathize with them. But the other side of it is you can be hurt. That sensitivity makes you vulnerable. In the last years, God has given me, our Father, has given me an increasing share in his paternity. In his paternity. I remember when I was preparing for ordination, I was uh, getting ready to read. I was lector on Sunday at a monastery where I was. And I remember coming up into the lectern to read, and they were uh, singing the responsorial psalm, and I was going to read the second reading. And uh, in the first pew was a very uh, beautiful young woman, and something clicked between us. It wasn't a bad thing was pure, it was good, but in an instant, in a flash of light, I saw how beautiful an individual can be and how beautiful it would be to share your life with somebody. 
and to have children. And now that all came in, in a flash of light, instantly. I didn't have time to think it out and reason. But I saw, I had never seen that in my life before, by the way. I never understood marriage and never wanted to get married, never did get married. But in a flash of light, I saw that. And in the same flash of light, sadness. I knew I would never, never have that joy of sharing my life with someone and having children. And yet, almost instantly on top of that thought came the understanding, the interior enlightenment. Oh, I'll give you a spouse. You'll be married. A matter of fact, I will give you my own bride. The church, the bride of Christ. Jesus is called the bridegroom. And his bride is the church. And every priest is taken up into Jesus, the high priest, and espoused to the church. And children, you will have children beyond counting. And I rejoiced in my heart. Uh, it, it was an amazing experience. And as the years have gone on, God our Father, who art in heaven, whose name is hallowed and I reverence him, and whose will I desire now, right here as it is in heaven, he gave me an increasing share in his paternity, in his fatherhood. You know, they call priest father, right? Uh, it is not just an empty tradition. Do you know why we are fathers? We beget children. As St. Paul said, I have begotten you through the preaching of the word. There is a potency in the word of God and it begets children. And so God has given me an increasing share in his own paternity. That's a two-edged sword. It's a wonderful thing to have children. But boy, it can torture you. It can hurt you. Two-edged sword. I'm thankful for the children, but with each passing day, the pain increases. And he gives me especially at night, in the silence, intensified vision of the plight of these children, poised, on the edge of disaster, so many of them. I wonder in a mystical way how our father grieves for his children. Oh, God is impassable, as we say in theology. God's impassable. That means, that word impassable means he can't suffer. In his divinity, he can't suffer. But God assumed a human nature. I mean, it is a theological fact that Jesus, God, a divine person, suffered through his human nature. And so in a mysterious way, God suffers. And, and he, in that paternity, that fatherhood, Pain, pain, the agony over your children. The Our Father, when you pray it, think about it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Yes, we are asking for the things we need. Uh, we need food. We need shelter. We need clothing. We need all those basic things. And we also need the bread from heaven. Jesus in the Eucharist, the greatest gift a loving God has ever given to his beloved children. Our Father gave us that gift of his Son. Give us this day our daily bread. What a gift, the Eucharist. Do not take it for granted, for someday we could lose it as they found out in communist countries, as the Holy Father has often reminded us, talking about what it was like in Eastern Europe during the reign of the communists, how having killed the priests and exiled them, the churches were left empty. And after a while, the people would come back, filtering in on Sunday. They'd take out the priest's vestment, lay them on the altar. they kneel down in the pews in silence, and the sound of weeping was heard in Eastern Europe because they had no priest. They had no priest to celebrate Mass. They had no priest to absolve their sins. They had no priest to anoint them into paradise. And they wept because they had taken that for granted. They had taken their fathers for granted. 
Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Another two-edged sword. I must forgive every offense, or I must not dare to presume to pray the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you. The measure with which you measure will be measured unto you. Don't be cheap with mercy. Be generous in dispensing mercy. How some of us have been hurt. <coughs> I mean, some of us uh, have been abused. Some, some people have been physically abused, sexually abused, verbally abused, abused in every conceivable manner. And to forgive the abuser can be a terrible trial. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. I remember a story of a man from World War II, a, a Jewish man and woman, Richard Wormbrunt, who later converted to Christianity. An SS officer came to their home and was going to take them off to the concentration camp. And Richard said to him, don't you believe in mercy? And the SS officer scoffed, no, I don't believe in mercy. There's no such thing as mercy. No such thing as forgiveness. You know, I'll prove it to you. And he called to his wife who was upstairs, Sabrina, come down. I want you to meet the man who murdered your entire family this morning. That's what had happened. And she came down and she looked at that Gestapo officer. And she said, if Jesus can forgive you, then so can I. You are forgiven. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass again. Lead us not into temptation. Now that is a, a translation which is not very good. No nos deas caer en la tentación. In Spanish. Much better. Much better. Uh, do not allow us to fall into temptation. Uh, God would never lead us into t temptation, a much better expression of it, do not allow us to fall into temptation. Protect us from a fall. Deliver us from evil. Now that is a prayer which the church has exhorted us to use as an exorcism prayer. That is something that the laity can use in their own state and life. In their own state and life. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. D deliver us from the evil one. Evil is not some kind of disinterested thing. It's personified. As the Holy Father taught, the devil is a person. Perverse and perverting. Real, a spiritual being, an angel, fallen angel. That's a fact of theology. That's a reality. Deliver us from evil. Look around. How much evil? I wonder how, how much more intensely we prayed the Our Father, that part of it especially on September 11th than we did September 10th. Deliver us from evil. The president made reference to it. We have seen the face of evil. And we did. Did you, did you hear the story right after? Maybe you saw it right after September 11th. You see that picture that went out on the internet and across the wire services? The picture of the, uh, the World Trade Center towers collapsed and in the smoke, the face of Satan. A little boy saw a picture of that printed out from the computer. Um, and he said to his family at dinner that night, he says, no, that's the wrong picture. He's a little kid, four or five years old. Wrong picture. No, no, no. He got all disturbed. He said, well, son, what's the matter? What do you mean? No, that's not right. So what do you mean it's not right? Uh, I'll show you. And a little boy drew with a crayon. And he drew those collapsed towers. And he drew Jesus with his arms outstretched. He said, there, that's the right one. Out of the evil has brought greater good. 
De but deliver us from evil, Lord, and, and hail full of grace. The angelic salutation, the Hail Mary, a reminder of the incarnation from that moment on when humanity never needed to be lonely or fearful again because it was at that moment through the fiat of the Virgin Mary and power of the Holy Spirit that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, uniting humanity and divinity together in the hypostatic union in such an intimacy. God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish in their sins, but come to everlasting life. That's what the Hail Mary reminds us of, the incarnation, the annunciation. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. It's a reminder of the great work of salvation, the incarnation. You see, it's so important, so important that we pray correctly, that you don't have to go through uh, as I did in, in, in depth every time you pray the rosary, but, but the prayers, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, they're deep. You could spend the rest of your life meditating just on the Our Father and the Hail Mary and it'd make you a saint. Many saints did that. And we pray the joyful mysteries first the annunciation and incarnation we recall as i said that the angel gabriel came down from heaven you know what that the three archangels that we know about there's more than that but the names we're familiar with right well, we have gabriel we have michael and raphael and they're biblical they're in the bible all three of them gabriel means the power of god the power of God, Gabriel, that's what the Hebrew word means. The power of God came down to the Blessed Mother and announced this. You're going to conceive and you're going to bear a son. You will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, God saves. That's what the word means. God saves, Jesus. We recall that in the Annunciation. And what happened? Our, Our Lady said, how can this be? She didn't understand it all. She said, how can this be? That indicates she didn't understand it all. Sometimes we don't understand it all. Sometimes you might not understand a certain teaching in the church. How come we can't do this or that? And I sympathize with that. I spent most of my life in that situation. Sometimes an event will happen and we can't understand it. I remember when I had first come home from the Army, after a few months, I got a call one Friday night from my sister. My littler sister had been in a car wreck. And I had to get in my car and race home to my hometown. And I was thinking, you know, you just don't know how bad is it. Oh, well, kids get all kind of bumps and bruises. Growing up, I sure did. I walked into the hospital, and as I walked in, there was my uncle, and I knew. I knew four of them killed, my sister among them. Why? I imagine my mother asked that question many a time. Why? I don't understand, Lord. How can this be? Don't ask why. Ask, how can I give glory in these present circumstances? How does God intend to sanctify me through the power of his cross right here and right now? Don't ask why, ask how. How can I serve you, Lord? Here I am. Come to do your will. So the Annunciation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, 
and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, who lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. As we conclude that first decade, just a note on that prayer between the decades. That's the Fatima prayer, taught to the children by an angel. It reminds us of some basic realities, the kind we don't really like to think about uh, too much. Oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins. That reminds us that we are sinners. It reminds us we need to repent. Save us from the fires of hell. I don't like to emphasize it. I don't even like to talk about it, but I have to because it's part of the truth. Hell is real, just like heaven. In the end, two ways are set before you, O man, the way of life and the way of death, the way of good, the way of evil, the way of truth, the way of lies. And the result of either choice, ultimately, will be heaven or hell. Those are the only two ultimate destinations in this journey. And so this decade prayer reminds us of that. But God wills not the death of any sinner. You can take comfort in that. God wills all men be saved. You don't have to worry about that. That's a fact, absolute fact. God wills all men be saved. The problem is not all men will to be saved. That's the problem. And so that's the battle. That's where the line of demarcation is drawn, the battle line. And um, that's my business. And that's yours. Some don't want to go, kicking and screaming maybe. And so our job is to get them there. The Deckhead Prayer reminds us of the reality of our of the battle, asking Jesus to save us from the fires of hell. All of us, all of us. The second joyful mystery is the visitation where Mary's cousin Elizabeth is visited by the mother of the Lord who just conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. She goes in haste through the hill country of Judah to visit Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth, already six months with child. Now, Elizabeth was an older woman, way beyond the age for childbearing. And she was, quote, barren. She had never had children. Now, in Israel, 
In Jewish religion and culture, this was considered a, a curse. You were a very unfortunate uh, and even less than good person. You must have done something real bad to be cursed that way. And that was a terrible reproach to bear for a woman. And it was a, a, an insult to her husband, and it was a terrible thing. But in her old age, uh, Elizabeth conceived. God arranged it, so to speak. And so Mary goes to visit her cousin, six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And as Mary approached her cousin's home, <coughs> Scripture tells us that the babe in her womb, the babe in her womb, the babe in Elizabeth's womb, leapt for joy. Now, this is what the Bible says. The babe in her womb leapt for joy. Now, I want to make a simple point, not rocket science here. The babe in her womb left, leapt for joy. Not the abstract fetal tissue in her womb. That doesn't leap for joy. The babe in her womb leapt for joy. Little boys and little girls leap for joy. It is a person, a human being. And if you don't think it's biblical, there it is, right there, reality. So the visitation. Our Lady goes to visit Elizabeth. Our Lady doesn't come alone. She's carrying the Word. Like the tabernacle contained Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, the Blessed Mother contained Him as a tabernacle of the living God. And as she approached Elizabeth and her son, John the Baptist, Mary carrying the Word within her, the light who went before her, the light of the nation, the light that would give John his power as the precursor, as the one who was the voice crying in the wilderness. Powerful gospel event. And we're praying it. The visitation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in the most need of mercy. The third joyful mystery, the Nativity. And we recall Christmas. We recall the great joy of Christmas. Joseph and Mary went to register for the census that had been called for, and they approached the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. House of bread. They needed a place to stay. Mary was with child and was about to deliver that child at any time. It was no doubt cold, night was fast approaching, and there was no room at the inn, Scripture says. No room at the inn. They went to the relatives, no room. They went to all the inns, no room. Two thousand years ago, no room at the inn. Two thousand years later, no room at the inn. Very often, no room at the inn of the human heart for Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And so they went to a place, it says a, probably a cave, where at times they would keep uh, animals. And there they made it as comfortable as they could, and the child was born. It says that Mary, his mother, laid him in a manger. Now I want to point out something to you here. They were in Bethlehem, the house of bread. His mother laid the one who would one day call himself the bread of life into a manger. A manger is a place where higher animals set food for lower. So once again, in the town of Bethlehem, house of bread, the bread of life is laid in a manger, a prefigurement of the Eucharist. Mary brought us her son. Mary always leads us to Jesus in the Eucharist. There is no authentic Marian devotion that isn't centered on Jesus Christ. It has to be centered on Jesus to be right. Everything the Blessed Mother does begins with and has to end with her son. You cannot say, Hail Mary, but that praise be Jesus Christ echoes through the heavens. Mary has a vocation too. Bring us to her son. Great joy of Christmas. Recall that at Christmas in Bethlehem, she laid him in a manger. And recall the great joy of the Eucharist. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, 
and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fire of hell. Lead all souls to heaven. The fourth joyful mystery, the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple. In fulfillment of the law, St. Joseph and our Blessed Mother brought the infant Jesus to the temple. And we know that there they meant prophet Simeon and Anna, who had been waiting for the Messiah many, many years, praying, as every good Jew did. Praying and waiting and hoping. They had expected a Messiah, really, that would deliver them from Roman domination, a political Messiah, a Messiah that would make all their problems go away, all the political problems they had. You, you see, Israel was held in a kind of submission to Rome, pagan Rome, and that was a terrible, terrible plight. Uh, nothing new for Israel. Remember that Israel had been in bondage in Egypt before, but it was particularly terrible. They, th this was a pagan government, the Roman government, and they were expecting a Messiah who would come in on a war horse and liberate them. But instead, he came in riding on the foal of a jackass. Uh, I, I always liked that particular reality from the gospel, that uh, Jesus, being the Son of God, he could have come with legions of angels and power and might, and I'll tell you at the end he will, but he didn't come that way. He came humbly. He came into the holy city of Jerusalem, seated on a very humble beast. He came riding into the city of God on a jackass. And I like to recall that he continues to do so. Those of us who preach know that although we convey the Lord, we can't claim any glory. We're pretty lowly beasts of burden. And yet, we convey this great treasure of Christ. He doesn't choose to come on the high and the mighty. He chooses to come on the lowly, the humble, the poor so often. And so when we recall that they presented him in the temple and the response, and you, mother, a sword shall pierce your soul, that the thoughts many nations might be revealed. Our Lady suffered with her son, beginning to end. She's called the uh, Mother of Sorrows. It's a devotion, the seven dollars of sorrows of Our Lady. She participated in redemptive suffering. 
It is a hard saying, but I can tell you, without any fear of error, I studied it a long time, and I know this is the church's teaching. If you want to enter into real power, if you really want to enter into the redemptive work of Christ, if you really want to strike a heck of a blow to evil, you will take up your cross daily and follow him. Our Lady was there. She suffered. And the suffering of the soul can be so much more intense. The suffering of the body is bad enough. But the suffering of the soul, a sword of sorrow shall pierce your own heart, your own soul. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fire of sin. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those who have mercy. The fifth joyful mystery, the finding of the child Jesus in the temple. As was their custom, they went up to the temple to worship. And it says that on their way home, uh, they thought that Jesus, the men and women went separately. You understand. Joseph thought Jesus was with Mary, and Mary thought Jesus was with Joseph. They lost the divine child. He was gone. Can you imagine the panic? When I was about 12 years old, my family went to Atlantic City, before Atlantic City had gambling. It was just a beach place to go. And we went there for a little vacation, and we stayed in a hotel on the beach. And we were on the, the beach, and my little sister, who would have been five years old, I think, at the time, disappeared. Uh, my mother thought she was with my father, and my father thought she was with my mother. She was gone. 
And you know, all kinds of thoughts race through your head at a moment like that. We didn't know she disappeared into the surf. And for about a half hour, it was intense anxiety. Uh, and then we found her, and everything was all right. But I can imagine the anxiety of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. Well, they retraced their steps, and they went back to the temple, to Jerusalem, looked for him, and, and there, lo and behold, he was in the temple talking with the Pharisees, with the doctors of the law, showing great wisdom. Uh, and asking and answering questions back and forth, no doubt. Well, they took him out and they said, Son, how could you have done this to us? I imagine the Holy Family was a little bit perturbed at that moment. How could you have done this to us? Didn't you know, our lady said, didn't you know your father not be searching for you? In great anxiety. And Jesus responded, Did you not know? that I must be about my father's business. And scripture tells us that without another word, Jesus, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, went home and was obedient to them. Lived with his mother, foster father, St. Joseph, until he began his public ministry, as far as we know, and he was obedient to them. I often think of that in the context of obedience. When I, as my grandma would say, oh, you're, Sonny, you're getting too big for your britches, when I think of that, I think Jesus was obedient. Uh, maybe God sends me something in accordance with his will that I don't like very much, or it happens regularly. Jesus was obedient. Who am I not to be? Sometimes we can think about that with respect to church authority, civil authority, and I always remember Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, he went home and was obedient to them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus. Jesus. 